Hello, this is Dr. Reed Schufer. I've created this presentation to help you understand your pet's heart problem. Please watch the video, and when you're done, I can entertain any questions you might have. In order to understand heart disease, we have to address a few basics about the circulatory system. In the mammal, the heart is a four-chamber organ and acts as a pump to distribute blood throughout the body. In this photo, you can see the heart separated into two sides, right and left. The left side of the heart is depicted in red because it is responsible for pumping oxygen-rich blood, which is red in color, to the body. The right side of the heart is depicted in blue because it is responsible for sending oxygen-depleted blood to the lungs where it picks up oxygen and gets rid of carbon dioxide. We can look at blood flow throughout the body like a big circular path. If we start in the left ventricle, we can see that freshly oxygenated blood is sent out the aorta to supply the body with oxygen and nutrients. The oxygen is used by the tissues and the blood becomes oxygen depleted. This blood returns to the heart through the vena cava and the jugular vein to the right atrium. The right atrium then contracts to help fill the right ventricle. The right ventricle pumps the blood to the lungs where it picks up oxygen and it gets rid of carbon dioxide. The oxygen-rich blood then returns to the left atrium to start the cycle again. We've talked about the different chambers of the heart. There is an atrium on the top of each ventricle. Their main purpose is to act as a storage tank for blood to allow for rapid filling of the ventricles when the atria contract. The right atrium receives blood from the body that has been depleted of oxygen, and the left atrium receives oxygenated blood from the lungs. There are one-way valves separating the atria and the ventricles. The tricuspid valve separates the right atrium from the right ventricle. As the name suggests, it has three leaflets or cusps. The mitral valve separates the left atrium from the left ventricle. The mitral valve has two leaflets. When they close, they form a watertight seal, which prevents blood from going from the ventricles back up into the atrium. There are thin tendrils of connective tissue, which prevent the valves from prolapsing into the left atrium, called the chordae tendinae, illustrated in this photo. In some dogs, the mitral leaflets, and sometimes the tricuspid leaflets, deteriorate with age. Instead of having smooth edges, the edges become irregular and gnarly. The irregular edges do not form a watertight seal between the atrium and the ventricle when they close, as you can see in the top picture to the right. The left ventricle is a powerful muscle. It must generate enough force to send blood throughout the body. When it contracts, most of the blood goes out the aorta to the body. But if there is a leak in the mitral valve, blood will flow into the left atrium under high pressure. This high pressured blood causes the thin walled atrium to stretch and enlarge. Here we have two radiographs of the chest. The image on the left shows a normal sized heart with a normal sized left atrium. The image on the right shows a heart with a very large left atrium as depicted by the arrows and the outline. Mitral valve degeneration generally affects small breed dogs who are over five years of age. The high risk breeds are listed below. The King Charles Spaniel has a very high incidence of mitral degeneration as well as other heart problems and may be affected as early as two to three years of age. When we are trying to diagnose a pet with mitral insufficiency, we start with the owner's history. Most pets with mitral disease will show symptoms, including increased thirst and urination, coughing frequently at night, reduced exercise tolerance, and as things progressed, labored breathing. If any combination of these symptoms are occurring, we have to consider the heart as a possible cause. A thorough physical examination should include careful auscultation or listening to the heart. When a pet has a leaky valve, 
the blood flowing backwards through the leap makes a whooshing noise. This sound is what we refer to as a murmur. We grade murmurs from 1 to 6 based on their intensity, with a grade 1 being a minor murmur and grade 6 being more severe. Once we hear a murmur, the next step is to take radiographs of the chest. The radiographs allow us to see the overall shape and size of the heart. We can evaluate the size of the left atrium and examine the lungs for signs of congestion or pulmonary edema. The electrocardiogram, or ECG, helps us determine if there are any irregular rhythms occurring in the heart, which can be common with mitral disease. Irregular rhythms can reduce the effectiveness of the heart's pumping ability and can sometimes be fatal. Diagnostic ultrasound is the most effective tool for diagnosing mitral insufficiency. The ultrasound allows us to see the beating heart in real time. With it, we can measure the size of the chambers, the thickness of the walls, as well as the pressures being developed in the heart and great vessels. This ultrasound image is using color flow Doppler to show the presence of mitral regurgitation. The modeled color on the screen depicts turbulent blood flowing the wrong direction into the left atrium, which is typical in mitral insufficiency. Many murmurs are found on pets without any symptoms. However, a leaky valve makes the heart work much harder than normal and eventually will lead to deterioration of the heart. To understand this, Consider that the brain is controlling the heart to deliver a certain amount of blood under a certain pressure to it at all times. Imagine the brain telling the heart, I need one quart of blood. The normal heart will fill up with one quart and pump it out and the brain will be satisfied. In a pet with a leaky valve, the heart will pump out a quart, but some of that quart goes backwards into the left atrium. Let's say that a fourth of the total volume goes backwards. That means only three quarters of the quart will get to the brain. The brain wants what it wants, so it will instruct the heart to pump harder until it receives the full quart of blood. In order to do this, the heart will stretch the, the ventricle, fill up with more blood, and pump harder until the brain is satisfied. The picture on the right shows a heart that has grown in size in order to compensate for the leaky valve. With time, the left ventricle muscle slowly weakens or wears out. It becomes an ineffective pump and blood begins to back up into the lungs. As the fluid accumulates, it will cause the dog to cough and breathe more rapidly. As the condition worsens, the fluid load may be so great that the dog cannot breathe due to pulmonary edema. This radiograph shows pulmonary edema. All of the area in the lung that is white is unable to exchange oxygen to the blood. This is a medical emergency and if left untreated is often fatal. Heart failure progresses predictably through four stages or classes. Class one is defined by a mitral murmur being present during auscultation, but no symptoms are noted by the owner. These pets are typically discovered during routine annual physical examination. Class two dogs have the murmur present, and yet the owners notice a reduction in exercise tolerance or coughing or difficulty breathing during heavy exercise, but are fine during normal activity. Class three pets are showing the symptoms of heart failure during routine activity, whereas class four pets are an advanced heart failure. They have difficulty breathing even at rest. These pets are very fragile and need extensive care in an ICU setting. Frequently, pets in class four heart failure will die from the disease, particularly if left untreated. Treating mitral insufficiency can be very effective and rewarding. Many dogs in the first three stages of heart failure can lead normal lives with treatment. Our treatment goals fall into five categories. First, we want to reduce the overall fluid load in the body. Second, we try to improve the performance and efficiency of the heart muscle. Third, we use appropriate diet to reduce the salt or sodium intake. Fourth, we attempt to maintain proper body weight. And finally, we allow only appropriate exercise for those pets depending on the stage of their disease.
Treatment for mitral disease varies with the stage of disease. Class 1 pets typically require no treatment unless ultrasound shows enlargement of the heart chambers, particularly the left atrium. Class 2 and 3 pets require oral medications and some dietary restriction. Class four pets <coughs> require extensive treatment, usually in an intensive care situation, to get them stabilized. And despite aggressive therapy, many of these pets will succumb to their heart failure. One of the first goals of therapy is to increase the efficiency of the heart. We use a drug called Vetmedin or Pimobendan to achieve this goal. In recent studies, pets with mitral murmurs and enlarged left atria gained an additional year before they went into heart failure when given Pimobendan compared to those who got a placebo. When pets are in heart failure, their hearts are not performing adequately and not providing the brain with the blood it needs. As a result, the brain sends signals to the kidney and other organs to increase the amount of fluid in the system. At first, this may benefit the overall blood pressure, but soon the fluid excess overwhelms the weakened heart and the heart failure worsens. We use drugs to counter the body's water retention. Benazepil is a drug which blocks an enzyme called angiotensin converting enzyme, which is responsible for retaining water in the kidneys. Generally is given once a day. Benazepril will help reduce the total fluid load on the body. In addition to benazepril, we use a potent diuretic called furosemide or Lasix, which is the trade name, to help reduce the fluid load in the body. Furosemide works directly in the kidney and causes the kidney to excrete more water as it forms urine. Furosemide is more potent than minazapril and does most of the heavy lifting when it comes to maintaining proper fluid levels in a cardiac patient. Furos furosemide can be given two to three times daily and the dose can be adjusted as needed to increase the amount of water loss. Furosemide can cause excessive water and potassium loss and must be monitored to ensure safety. Dogs in stage two through four should have diets that are restricted in sodium. We generally start with Hill's KD or kidney diet, which has moderate salt restriction. As the disease progresses, we may move over to Hill's HD or heart diet to make more sodium restriction. Pets in heart failure cannot tolerate sudden infusions of salt so we must eliminate all salty, salty snacks as well. When it comes to exercise, we can adjust what is allowed based on the stage of the disease. Dogs in class one or asymptomatic pets need no restrictions. They can live perfectly normal lives for many years before exercise must be restricted. Once the disease progresses to classes two and above, you, the owner, must impose limits on the dogs because they typically will not limit their own exercise until their symptoms are severe. As owners, you must evaluate what your pet can tolerate. With time and progression of the disease, the restriction on exercise will have to be more intense, but usually by the time symptoms are bad, your dog is not going to want to exercise as much. It's important that we monitor the effects of cardiac drugs on the body. Because we are technically dehydrating the body, we can run into issues with the kidneys and electrolytes. It is common to test dogs before starting heart, medi heart medications and one to two weeks after starting to make sure they can handle the drugs. After that, twice yearly testing is highly recommended. We know that the rate of breathing in a sleeping dog can tell us whether or not the lungs are filling with fluid or not. When a pet is sleeping, his breathing rate is determined by the brain stem alone. If the brain is not getting enough oxygen, it tells the body to breathe more rapidly. We've discussed how fluid accumulates in the lungs when pressure backs up from the left ventricle. When this happens, there is less room for oxygen exchange. When this happens, the brain will increase the breathing rate to compensate. A normal dog will breathe under 30 times a minute when sound asleep. Most dogs will be below 20 breaths per minute. When the sleeping respiratory rate exceeds 30 breaths per minute, it is probably due to buildup of fluid in the lungs. If you keep track of this respiratory rate, you can use the increase in respirations as an early warning sign and let us know so we can adjust medication levels. Doing this regularly can help reduce the chance that your pet will end up in a cardiac crisis. 
Measuring sleeping respiratory rate is pretty easy. Keep in mind a few guidelines. First, your pet must be sound asleep for this to be accurate. The time of day is not important, only that he or she is sound asleep. We like to get an average of three rates to be more accurate. You can do this by counting the number of breaths in a minute. Skip a few minutes and repeat it. Skip a few more minutes and repeat one more time. If you, have, if you total the three values you get and divide by the, the total by three, you will come up with the average breaths per minute. You should do this at least two times per week. It's recommended to put a reminder in your phone to help you remember to do it. Fortunately, there is a free app called Cardalis, available in the Apple App Store and Google Play Store for Android, which makes tracking sleeping respiratory rates simple. I highly recommend you download and use this app. The prognosis for pets with mitral valve disease varies with many factors. Pets diagnosed in class one with no symptoms may have two to three years before symptoms start to occur, and then another two to three years before they may succumb to the disease. Once symptoms begin to appear, the prognosis depends on how early we detect the disease, how well your pet responds and tolerates to the medications, and how well you are able to administer the drugs on a regular basis. For dogs who are presented in class two with symptoms only after exercise, generally we may expect two to four years of life expectancy. Pets in class three may live an average of 1.5 to three years, whereas dogs in class four may have a much shorter survival time. I wanna thank you for your attention. I know there was a lot of detail in this presentation, but considering your pet has a serious disease, I think this information should be helpful to you. If you have any questions, feel free to ask me either in person or over the phone or by email. Thanks again.